The Diabetes Podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first speaking to your doctor. And welcome back, everyone, die buddies and non die buddies, uh, to another episode of the podcast. Uh, today, we are interviewing our first non diabetic here on the podcast, uh, but with a very awesome topic. Uh, today, we are talking with Zach. He is the man, the legend behind Cedar Oaks Kennels, which is a kennel and training facility for diabetic alert dogs. Uh, so, I don't personally have a lot of information behind this myself, so I'm very excited to have this conversation with Zach and see what uh, what happens. So, Zach, thanks for joining the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. Right on. So, uh, absolutely. So, first uh, question right out of the gates, what is a diabetic alert dog? So, a diabetic alert dog is a is any dog who is trained for public access to go um, into public situations or situations that would be deemed service dog related. Um, and that dog alerts to hyper or hypoglycemic uh, changes. So low and high blood sugars. Um, we also apply those dogs to, like we're training a dog right now for a girl who has hyperinsulism um be, now you guys being the doctors you know more than i do but it mimics type one from my understanding with the lows so she, this little little girl is in need of a dog as well to alert because she's nonverbal. um mm. so the dogs the dogs do that the dogs pick up through uh your scent of mouth and um those changes also can be produced by sweat but we don't do that as a primary just because, you know, you might not want to know, you, you might not be sweating that day. So you're always going to breathe. Mm -hmm. So we take it off your breath through saliva. And that's basically what a diabetic alert dog is. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll have a, a few more questions in a bit about how you actually train that, um, especially the, the insulin, the hyperinsulinemia and the case you just brought up, because that seems interesting. Um, but how long have you been doing this? What's a, and what's a recent diabetic alert dog or dad story, um, you know, that you can kind of share with us? So Cedar Oak Kennels, we, we started out just training obedience dogs, moved into uh, gun dogs, opened a multifaceted facility, training um, boarding dogs, and, uh, you know, just taking care of our community and providing pets. In the meantime, my ultimate goal was to move to diabetic alert dogs. Um, I've only been doing it regularly for about three years. Uh, before that, it was, a, it was a hard market to break into. It's very niche market, as I'm sure you guys understand. And the awareness of the dads just isn't there. And that's our acronym for them is we call them dads. So... I trained probably four to five in hopes of making them dads. And I just couldn't find any, I couldn't give them away. There's a JDRF uh, chapter on the Illinois side of St. Louis who had been, they, I don't know how all that works, but they give back to JDRF. They raise independently and then donate to JDRF. We put a dog in their auction and at the auction, we, we gave the dog to the family and they still were like, Oh, it's just a big commitment. We don't, we don't necessarily want it. And, uh, it was pretty disheartening, but we finally have broke through the niche here in the past year. Um, and, and we're here to confidently stay. Uh, but it, it's been a long road getting here for sure. Um, so that's kind of, it's kind of how that's going. Wow. So there's a, what, what drives you? Cause I mean, for two years, not breaking in a niche, um, I'm going to, there's a side of both uh, Dr. Grady and I that are very like business mind oriented. So I don't want to go down the business loop ra rabbit holes too often, but, uh, or too much, but what is, uh, what drives you being a non type one diabetic to stick in something like that for two years, not really getting a lot of, um, 
you know, people interested in, in the dogs? Um, you know, what, what really has pushed you in, to be in this type of market and train these type of dogs? So actually a lot of things. Um, I went, let's back up. So we'll just go down the storyline of Zach real quick. Cool. Remember I was in eighth grade, my mom, we, we live in a small town. So you start driving when you're like six and, uh, went and got my hair cut and we're dry. She's like, do you want to drive? And I'm like, yeah. So we're driving down the highway and I'm like, Hey, mind you, I'm 14. There's, there's a fire by our house. I hope our house is on fire. We come around the corner. It wasn't our house. It was the neighbors. I threw the car in park, opened the door and I ran to the house and got tackled in the middle of the field. Um, by two two neighbor men don't I don't remember who they were but I was going in the house to help um, probably crazy probably no one should ever do that but it was just in me to go and help and I knew I knew the family and I was like I'm going um, fire department arrived no one was in the house everything was fine fast forward a little bit farther I went to school that day I decided I was going to be a firefighter paramedic Went to school to be a firefighter paramedic. Um, ended up getting a job in Department of Corrections in Illinois while in school. So it's like, cool, let's go this route. Went to corrections and didn't like it, but we have a lot of diabetics in DOC, especially type two. So on midnight, you get them out before breakfast and everyone lines up for their shots and gets their insulin for the day. And, you know, you put them back up. So talking to the nurses, being medic minded, I was like, Oh, this is really neat. Like, and just kind of dove into learning a little bit about it. Uh, I ended up not making any corrections. It was not for me. Um, the stress of the job was not for me. I was way too young to be there and decided that probably being a firefighter or paramedic would lead me down the same path of negative negativity and the fact that I can never turn off the job. Um, it's always part of me. It's always something I, I am and I, I couldn't stop it. I couldn't turn it off, which especially in corrections is not a great thing. Uh, so tried a couple jobs, didn't work, didn't work. And our propane bill needed paid. And my wife's like, you better figure this out. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can train dogs and we can get the bill paid. So I start, at the, there's some other stuff that goes into that. I picked up a gun dog and the gun dog didn't work out. Um, had all these dog trainers helping me teach, teach me how to fix the dog and trained a couple pet dogs. But anyway, so I'm at the point where I can train dogs and I call these people up and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to start doing a training class. Would you be interested? And they're like, yeah. So then I post it on Facebook. Next thing you know, we got like 12 people staying in our garage and I'm training obedience classes going, Oh, I don't know how to answer that question. Oh, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> so I told my wife, I'm like, I really like this and we're, we're making decent money at it, but I don't know the answers to all these questions. Went and trained dogs with this lady in Mississippi and she trained diabetic alert dogs originally. She also couldn't handle the stress of dealing with diabetics or not dealing with diabetics, but dealing with the stress of losing a diabetic in the middle of the night to a dog. That the dog didn't intervene and do its job oh. and she couldn't turn that off. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. That's a, that, the risk versus reward there. I think that's worth it. And so that, that really clicked the gear. Came home from there to start my business back here. And my wife and I were sitting at Cracker Barrel and uh, still really unsure how we're going to make Cedar Oak Kennels become a full thing um, where, it's, where it's taking over. I don't have to have a side job. Mm -hmm. and we're sitting there and gentleman behind us at Cracker Barrel in uh, Collinsville was being made fun of. He appeared to be homeless. He was alone. He was elderly, not, he wasn't misdressed, but he, you know, he wasn't very well put together. And uh, 
my wife and I were sitting there going, wow, why are these people making fun of him? And talking about how sad it was. And he seemed a little drunk, maybe from the night before we assumed. And as we're eating dinner, I began to smell a musk from him. And I'm like, oh, he has to be drunk. Like the poor guy, like, you know, he's single, probably single, doesn't have a family. You know, your brain starts creating a story that's not even true. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, he's diabetic. And my wife looks at me and she's like, what? Mind you, she is a surgical tech um, at the time at SLU. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Dr. Octoman or not, but she worked with Dr. Octoman for a long time. Um, and now she's here locally in Redbud. But so she's medically minded too. Uh, not in emergency medicine, but still, you know, kind of things like that. And I'm like, he's diabetic. And she's like, you're right. And as I stood up, I caught him in his chair before he passed out and he passed out in my arms and, you know, told her to call 911. She told someone else to call 911. She has somebody get him an orange juice and we start, you know, putting a straw in his mouth and praying that he's just going to suck on this orange juice. I don't know what happened to him. The paramedics arrived and we got out of their way so they could do their job and we went home. Wow. That's what drives me. <laughs> wow. wow. And that's a, that's a kind of a crazy, uh, between both those stories, well, I mean, three, but uh, both those stories, of, you know, the selflessness of you just willing to throw yourself in the middle of it uh, is, is really honorable uh, and really cool. Um, so do you just recognize the smell because of the description of, you know, when you were learning how to train dogs and you met that other diabetic alert dog trainer or, or how well, did you, I, I how did, did you take click? a class. I did, I did do an EMT class, okay. um, was trained by a paramedic who was really good. And I think, I don't think I remember anything about medicine at all. Maybe bite the dust is how you should, you should do the, sing the song, bite the dust while you do CPR. That's yeah. about it, right? It's been, now it's been almost 10 years, but she taught me how to be a thinker and how to think outside the box in situations that you don't want to think in. And I think I just, you know, I recognize the signs that diabetics look drunk can act drunk and seem drunk. And then it just finally, I don't know if I put that smell together and it just clicked, yeah. but I don't know. My brain just went, he's diabetic. And I mean, I, I caught him within seconds. It was really weird how it all, I think it took my brain that long to catch up to what was going on with him. Um, but yeah, it just kind of happened. It's weird. Wow. So even that, you know, you're di you're not diabetic. Your wife's not diabetic. You, you have lived a life of that seems that you're willing to go out and go an extra mile. And, um, you've almost kind of fallen, followed a road that was almost unpredictable that led you down to training dogs, but yet, most people, if something drives them, it's somehow related to them, but you are, it, it keeps you up at night. Cause you, you literally, you know, could have saved this guy's life, you know, and that, that's really cool that you have this, um, this, this way of thinking that of selflessness to push through two years of not being in a niche of a business to really get it up and running is, uh, is really impressive. So that's amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the same can be said about both of you guys eight years of med school. <laughs> mm -hmm. <I'll>, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. The amount of schooling. It, so, so we went to chiropractic school, but uh, you know, it's, it's very similar in terms of the actual schooling time and, and credits. Uh, and so it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, but being diabetic is kind of what drives us to be in the professions that we are. So um, fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's okay. So you, you push through the two years um, and then you just started breaking into um, people knowing about you guys and, and really kind of being able to, to get these dogs and people's families. Right. Um, so what's the training process been for these past three years and, and versus now, and if it's any different. 
so so it's completely changed because i've evolved as a dog trainer and i think just as i'm sure you guys have evolved as doctors we could i continue to evolve every day so mm -hmm. every dog we put out is just better and better but three years ago you know i was just trying to to get it i was amazed by a dog that i could get to act well in public to where now I have a process to get that dog through each situ situation that it's going to be prepared for. We start with basic obedience. Um, we layer pressure. We teach everything with food, positive reinforcement. Um, so reward-based training for people that aren't up on uh, dog training, but mm -hmm. just basically, hey, sit, food, sit, food. And then we layer pressure over that with a abrasive collar of some sort. So in our case, we use prong collars, um, which people frown upon sometimes when they see them. Uh, but actually, believe it or not, compared to like a traditional slip lead or choke collar, they use tracheal pressure. Pinch collars grab around the skin so that they, if put on properly, they don't choke the dog. Um, even though they look mean, they're really not. Um, so we layer pressure over that, and then we take the dog out into public. Once the dog's able to be in public and handles public well, and we can see the dog go through distractions, because ultimately, and I probably should hit on it longer than that, service dogs, no matter what the job is, the hardest thing for them is to go into, say, a sports arena during a soccer game or a football game with you know loudspeakers and fireworks maybe going off and to remain focused on their handler so handler focus is what we look for and if you don't have it the dog doesn't know you know if you're out of whack or not if he's off staring at the cheerleaders like a little boy well he doesn't do us any good right yeah so we absolutely want to do pay attention and have handler focus once we have that then we um and we start to see that that hey this dog has the potential he's handling the situations fine we move through and apply start applying the scent we start doing the scent work um because we are a small facility i don't have time to waste on a dog and i don't mean that negatively but if a dog isn't going to make it as a service dog because of those distractions, I don't want to put this time and effort of scent work into them. Instead, I can career change the dog and make him a gun dog or rehome him as a free pet, or maybe he can become a PTSD service dog and we can donate him to a veteran or something like that. Being a, a diabetic alert dog, the dog himself has to be very special in the fact that he has to be calm and assertive in public well behaved but then the moment it smells a change and you know smells a change we want to click we want an arm switch up whoa there's my toy can you give it to me and once they go boop, 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 you know hey yes good job there's your toy let me check oh look at my phone oh there's my low yay good job dog so doing that from going like real monotone to like hey is your dog okay and people will they'll be like is your dog sick no dog's well behaved <laughs> so uh, that big change is is hard um and not all dogs are cut out for it so then once we apply the scent um you know then it's it's all games and uh it actually it's the fun stuff so it's really weird how it switches but yeah. So how, how much does the person that you're training it for need to interact with the training? Is that done at the end or is that mixed in? So it's totally done at the end, but it depends. We, we do offer three different dogs. We offer started dogs, uh, and an intermediate dog in between, and then we offer fully trained dogs. Um, this, in the retrieval world, they coined the term finished. I don't like the word finished because a dog's just like a human's never done training. You're always getting better. Uh, and the expectations always grow higher, but you know, a fully trained dog, 
I deliver that dog and, and actually all my dogs, I deliver the dog to the owner, to the handler. And then we spend three days with them. And in that three days, I teach, I can't teach them to be a dog handler in three days, but I can give them a basis of knowledge and language that we both can speak on the same terms that when I come back to them via Zoom, FaceTime, a phone call or a text, that we can speak about the dog and I can progress them through the dog's training. Uh, and not to talk about other places, but many non-for-profits, probably due to time restraints and manpower, require uh, you know, their new owner handlers to come to them three or four times during training. Mm. I, don't, I don't do that. People, people have jobs insulin's expensive these dogs are a huge investment and i can't afford to fly them here so i feel to require them to come to me it it's tough on them um mm -hmm. and it might be a reason why they choose not to get a dog from me so however that being said i allow with 48 hour notice for anybody to come uh to the kennel and check it out and you know if they want to see their dog while he's in training come see him yeah. great that's cool um, so, so after you've, you've, uh, delivered that to them, you still stay in contact with them on a regular basis and, and keep working on the training then? Yeah, absolutely. Especially with our started dogs, right? Because they're just getting used to it. They're just starting to do it. They probably haven't done nighttime alerts yet. Um, which that's the big, that's the big hard one, right? Yeah. Once this dog has to sleep too, the dog's sleeping. Now he wakes up in the middle of the night um, to alert or she, and, and that's a hard job. Um, so we were on the constant phone with them helping, but then in, in a hard time I have with parents is, uh, you know, the dog will miss, if a dog misses and they will miss, uh, we're about 75 to 80% success rate is our goal. I have a dog in Tennessee. She's, she's amazing. Uh, she's 91%. Wow. is her, her, is her success, success rate. So that's really cool. But, you know, our ultimate goal is, is to save somebody's life. And if 75% of your lows can be caught in the middle of the night, like I'm winning. Oh yeah. So, yeah. How yeah, long is, oh, I'm sorry, go. Uh, yeah. I just added uh, one more question kind of off of those. Um, so can you describe the difference between a starter dog and a, you know, mid range dog and then a finished dog? Yeah. So it's, it's a level of time that we have in, in their alerting, um, the situations I'm going to put them in and then more so than anything is the time that we have in public. Um, I train all of my dogs to the started to the started level of scent work. I get them all alerting on person before they leave. They all have, uh, unless we have another option that kind of gets confusing. So I won't go down that so much, but we import already trained dogs and then I layer scent on them so they can get them in a home quickly. Oh, okay. So if you have a diabetic who's became unaware and they've like the situation we were talking before the podcast where guys having seven or eight lows or seven or eight seizures a year, you know, we want to get a dog to them super fast. Yeah. And if finances aren't an issue, we buy already trained gun dog from the United Kingdom. I bring that dog across and then I teach the dog the new game, which is find the scent. And instead of finding a dead bird, the dog now finds your stinky mouth yeah. <laughs> uh, to put it politely. So, um, you know, I'm just switching the game and, and that I can do that in five months, but with all the other dogs, we, we take them all through scent imprinting. We put them on a training scent wheel, which I can send you guys pictures of, but it's this giant wheel. That's about six and a half foot across and the dogs alert on that from there. They learn to alert, uh, in a box, a scratch box. So they learn to scratch. So there's our secondary alert. And then they learn to alert to this little canister that looks like uh, m, m canister that the little kids pop the lid on. Mm. And they alert on that. 
from there, now the option is because I have a small family and we're a small kennel, am I bringing that dog home and putting it in my kid's room and having the dog alert to my kid in the middle of the night? Am I bringing that dog into my bedroom and having that dog alert to me? Am I taking the dog to my kid's track uh, meet that he had today and working the dog there? So that extra time that really should be my time, uh, fairly, I think, um, I give it up and, and I train your dog to a higher level. So real life scenarios, we should say. So it just based on how much time I do that and how often I do it. You know, okay. the started dogs, we do it a couple times. A fully trained dog, I might do it for six months. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my, my next question. What's the, the time length of those different variations in terms of, you know, Zach, I want to get a dog right now. And uh, about what's the length of training to get there? You said six months to get a pretty advanced uh pretty advanced dog or, or so to get to the start of the level first we have to get through that fun puppy stage <laughs> i roll my eyes as i say that for the listeners <laughs> eight weeks to 20 weeks is uh you know i wouldn't mind if i had one puppy and that's all i did but <laughs> we actually actively are looking for puppy racers to raise puppies for us from eight weeks to 20 weeks at five months I start training. It's a three month training program to get to the start level, to get to where we can go into public and the dogs acting well. After those three months, then it's eight to 12 weeks of uh, scent training. So within six months, I can have you a started dog from the time I start. So that start rate at five months, at 11 months of age, I can have you a started dog. Um, going to fully train you know we're looking at nine to eight you know nine to 18 months depending on the dog and depending on the specific skills that we're teaching what makes that unique is your hobbies so what's your hobbies uh working out uh lifting eating <laughs> uh board games really <laughs> he's, he's also he's also a runner um yeah yeah but yeah what do you do dr grady uh so i i mean working um at the office around a lot of patients um and then like like garrett going to the gym um i also do some shooting both archery and and firearms and um yeah I'm drawing a blank, but I'm really oh. putting you guys on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Grady's okay. a little more adventurous in terms of hobbies. Yeah. He, he, oh, hiking, uh, hiking and, and yeah, me too. Biking and stuff like yeah. that. Do either one of you kayak? I have, I am. I don't like have a kayak, but I have, I enjoy it. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. Like so, it. so let's use an example. Somebody okay. calls me up and they white water raft kayak. Okay. What am I going to do with the dog while you go down that river? Yeah. Uh, leave him? Nope. He's going with you. So I have to go. Uh, I don't kayak, but I'm a dog trainer. So yeah. I would go buy a kayak. If somebody called and said, hey, I white water raft quite frequently, I'd say, okay, wow. great. Guess I'll go learn that. Um, yes. <laughs> train wow. the dog on the kayak obviously the mississippi's right here i'm not going on the mississippi in a kayak but the kaskaskia is on the illinois side and i've been on the kaskaskia with a kayak i'll get on a kayak and kayak down the river with that dog and then we'll upscale that uh now i don't know how you what you call you know various degrees of white water but i'll find the roughest white water in southern illinois i can and go down that and that's where hobby specific also uh dr grady and you shooting um introduction to gun is a whole process so i would i would teach the dog to be okay around gunfire without reacting to it and still focus on you so that's where for those fully trained dogs it's not necessarily oh i gave a vague answer of nine to 18 months but being a fully trained dog for a diet dr garrett where it's boring 
Um. <laughs> uh, that's fair. That's fair, though. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and no offense to you, but I mean, I, mean, I live in Wisconsin. Not... I just drink beer. That's that's what the hobby is. Okay. Whoa. Well, so now, see, now that's difficult. Do you drink beer in a bar or do you drink beer in a brewery? <laughs> it matters. If 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 I were were, it would be more likely a bar than a brewery, especially with COVID going on. But uh, but okay. Bar. So so if if you go into a bar, and it depends on the bar, but if you you have small town yeah. bars yeah you know the there might be a bar are... fight that night or yeah. there's a loud band that night or yeah you know there's a wedding or a party bus so now i got to put that dog in a large crowd where the dog's prepared to deal with those stresses yeah um and so breweries are completely different too you know the yeast smell and breweries and the hops and everything the malt that goes into it completely different smell yeah it stinks <laughs> That's what my steady <laughs> smells like. <laughs> so, um, anyway. so if you guys think about it that way, though, you know, you could see really quickly how it varies dog to dog and what a fully trained dog for you versus what a fully trained dog for me looks like is totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously I try to prepare each dog for anything that might come up randomly, like a white water rafting trip. Mm -hmm. um, but or a wedding I or, yeah a, yeah absolutely a wedding or uh court mm -hmm. um you know the dogs have to be prepared to go through normal day life but then if you have some off the wall hobby which i'm finding diabetics too yeah uh mm. they come from fitness and and it seems like a lot of them i'm just totally stereotyping that shit in 2020 <laughs> 2021 yeah, but uh are. You know, there's a lot of people who are are trying to do the most they can to control things. It's especially your guys' core group of listeners. And mm -hmm. in working out in crossfitting, you find that all oh, this is boring. I could go hike this trail and still get my calories burned. Or, you know, we we could go do this and it's a lot more fun than just sitting at the gym. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the gym, but <laughs> I'll get off my, my soapbox well, about it. We're coming at you, Zach. We're with pitchforks. How dare you <laughs> belittle our gyms? <laughs> no, I I'm should kidding. find one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's very specific and that's very tailored. Um, is there a reason why you use British labs for all this compared to other, uh, I almost said strains, like it's a bacteria probiotic uh other breeds of lines dogs. lines <laughs> um absolutely so okay. not all but working dogs are built and bred around the competition that they strive in mm. you know um and then even more so in where it becomes tailored in the labradors is that maybe sometimes we don't tailor the dog around the competition and rather the trainer's inabilities to train a dog to do that task. And I'm beating some people up on that. The American Labrador trainer is kind of, in a way, mocked by other trainers in the fact that they train with pressure based systems and that's okay and i really actually there's some parts of it that i'm like huh, yeah you're on to something there so the electric collar which is so controversial but the electric collar came out for the hunting hunting dog world and then the retriever guys just took it and ran with it and perfected training with it and what happened by that is they bred a dog who could handle a lot of pressure which if you think about our social pressures, that might be a good thing. But what ended up happening is they, they ended up breeding uh, dragon, dragon breeding uh, cow cheaters who if not properly socialized or entertained through either work or uh, activity of exercise, they don't 
handle themselves very well. So back up to the British and the way they train their competition. And, and also I'll hit on this. The American competition is at most a dog and another dog side by side. A dog is never more challenged than whenever another dog is across from him performing his job. Yeah. Think about, and I don't know who's a good example, but uh, Connor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. And hey, you guys are going to play darts or, or the boxing game where you hit the, oh, yeah, in yeah. the arcade where you hit the bag as hard mm-hmm. as you can. Put Connor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather together and put a leash around Floyd's, well, actually, Connor's neck and say, sit, watch. Mm-hmm. He's going to do it 100 times better than you. And watch how mad Connor would get, right? Yeah. In a make believe world. So that's what you do to this dog in competition. And these dogs, I mean, they're super athletes in American Labs. They're just sitting there shaking. And, you know, and you can every now and then, even in competition, you hear them start to whine and because they yeah. just can't, and they can't control themselves. They're just, they walk up to the line, they're just studs, right? So in Europe, in the UK, they don't have, duck hunting and goose hunting like we do where we sit over top of decoys and the birds come in and work down and you know we do our thing over there it's all driven hunts and so there'll be a wall of people and you walk and the birds will push up and you shoot them and then the dog goes and retrieves them so in competition what they do there is they have 12 to 16 dogs on the same line at the top level off leash no dogs on leash and they're not in american trials either and i don't want to misportray that they're all that's all at competition level it's all off leash no e-collars no training tools right but getting there they use training tools the british however they're walking next to each other with 12 dogs on the same line all off leash they're not allowed to speak to the dog too loudly Uh, If the dog would go to the bathroom during its time in competition, it's eliminated. If the dog barks or whines, it's eliminated. If the dog breaks or dogs will show excitement by patting their feet on the ground, if they do that, eliminated. So if the dog shows too much excitement, eliminated. But then still ask to drive through uh, like beats. So probably similar to like a bean field here. A standing bean field's up to your waist, and I don't know if you've ever looked through it, but you can't see through it. Mm -hmm. And then it has to go, this dog has to go 150 yards and pick up a bird in the standing bean field. Mm. So we still have to have the same drive, but we have to have the off switch to be remain calm and relaxed. And that's why we use British laps because the obedience is just as much a part of the competition as the game finding and the temperament and the drive and the style of the dog where Americans focus more on the go and the hardiness of the dog. How far can that dog go? Um, Where the British want, they work closer and tighter and they want to see, and they call it a gentleman's dog. And this happens. A lot of my friends, they'll be picking up dogs in the UK and there'll be a duke of something you know 100 feet away from them shooting birds well if duke of something thinks your dog's out of control uh i don't know uh look at what they did to harry kick them out yeah (laughs) so (laughs) um you know i just those british there uh they don't win world wars but they really they're really not good with uh with mannerisms and disrespect right yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so do you go? You actually fly over there and pick out the dogs yourself, or, or how does that work? Unfortunately, I don't yet. Um, we finally got to a point where I was about ready to, and then COVID hit. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have built relationships uh over the years with people who i trust and work with frequently through the gun dog work and i just call them and say hey i need xyz and this much drive and this much off switch find me the perfect dog it doesn't always work 
right? There, there's sometimes where it won't work, uh, very unlikely, but if that would happen, Cedar Oak Kennels just takes care of it when we get a new dog. Oh, but yeah. yeah, they said they're, they're really, these guys have been doing this since they've been actively sending British Labradors over here to kennels since the 1990s on a oh. regular basis. Um, but the Labradors originated from the UK. Uh, they came from the St. John Water Dog in Canada, went to the United Kingdom. The Kennel Club of England is a governing body, which AKC, American Kennel Club, is not. So they can control things a little more in-house. They keep super, super good records of health. And um, that's huge bono to us because these service dogs are a huge investment. And that's probably the third question people ask okay, what's the guarantee on health? Or are you concerned about health? No, I'm not. Because I can go back and see great grandpa had, didn't have X, Y, Z blood diseases and his hips were this. And then his off, his 60 offspring are all good on hips and elbows. Well, more than likely, you know, percentages say your puppy's just fine. So, which is amazing. You can't do that in America. Um, so that's another another huge reason for using them. But no, we will get over there soon. But I haven't been yet. Um, but I have a lot of good friends, and with thank God of Facebook and Messenger, you know, talk to these guys every day. So mm -hmm. yeah. So so now working with one breed like this or one line, like you say, um, do you have people that want to use a different dog for whether it's just personal reasons or maybe they have allergies to pet dander or something like that. And they want like a hypoallergenic dog. Every day people call and ask if I can train their three-year-old pet dog to be a diabetic alert dog to the level that I train to. Yeah. And I tell them no. If somebody called me with a puppy and I evaluated it, I might think about it, but I'm probably going to convince them, do my best to convince them not to because I know this breed in and out. I know, I usually know what the, the specific lines are going to produce and what, what the reactions are going to be. And as a business, it takes the risk analysis out of it for, for my peace of mind, if I know the dog and I can say, no, I, you know, by the time I train that dog and I know the lines, you know, a lot of times I can tell you what the dog's going to do before it does it, just because I know its sister did that, its brother did that, its cousin did that. And I'm like, oh, well, guaranteed at this age, we're going to show this negative sign and this positive sign. And we work through those. Where if you bring me a random, a random dog, I, I can't tell you that about it. I, I mean, there's certain things dogs will show, but I can't, I can't bet on the day or the yeah. week. Hey, at 13 weeks, this dog's going to look like this. And you're going to think it's amazing, but at 20 weeks, it's going to lose some drive or it's going to mm -hmm. pick up drive. And, you know, we need to put more drive into this line versus that line. So to answer that question, no, the hyperallergenic um, people, especially here lately, the golden doodles have really gained a fame. I own a golden doodle. I'm not a golden doodle basher. Uh, <laughs> well, my wife owns one. Uh, <laughs> but he's a good dog I, she keeps asking for another one and i keep saying no uh, <laughs> we breed british labradors but uh, you know they're good dogs but there's some health things that can't be controlled there because a lot of these people breeding them probably you're just buying this golden retriever and this poodle and let's see if it works and they end up with good puppies well yeah. that's luck yeah unfortunately um but there's some other breeds out there that are hypoallergenic and uh we're actually looking at working with um uh two different kinds of spaniels okay uh, so i'm gonna see how that's going and there's so there's an english cocker and then there's a springer spaniel and i'm looking at both those breeds there's a guy uh in central illinois that breeds really really good english cockers that gets them from the same around the same area where I buy my British labs from. Okay. And then I have a, a good friend in Canada who has an excellent line of Springer Spaniels from the UK. And we've, so we're looking at those as alternatives for people who are just 
anti-Labrador. But let me finish on this. All Labradors or all dogs want to be Labradors and all Labradors want to be black. So just buy the black lab. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> so um, that being said, do a lot of parents or families then push back and like get really upset? Cause I mean, it's, it's not a liability that you have when it comes to picking these these dogs to train and to what capacity it's not a liability but you have the sense of duty of this dog needs to be able to handle these situations and alert them when so they don't die like you that's how you like think about this so how easily does do people and buyers get that if they get frustrated of oh i I just don't want a british lab but i want you to train my dog well i don't know if you guys notice in talking to me and the listeners can hear my voice but (laughs) I don't have room for ifs and maybes and your feelings. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, there, it is. there it is. I'm a dog trainer. And, th- and yeah. there's a big problem here in this country of over humanizing animals. And you're going to get some hate on me. But listen, up to the age of five, dogs and humans think alike. At age five, Babies are capable of feeling love to an extent, okay? Dogs are able to feel love to an extent. But human intelligence doesn't truly kick in and completely take over until age of five. And you could argue that there's some three-year-olds out there who are totally light years ahead with maturity, and there's some five-year-olds who are behind, right? But let's just talk in generalization stereotypes, uh, because with dogs, you know, if you put three trainers in the same room, the only thing two of them are going to agree on is the other guy's wrong. So <laughs> there's a lot of opinion. But for the most part, dogs don't need human emotions with words such as love, affection, and ear hugs. Rather, what they need is structure, routine, maintenance exercise now depending on how you look at it that's love and can be seen as love but to the dog he goes oh at 5 a.m every day he wakes up and gives me food i don't know if the dog says oh he loves me and truthfully unfortunately i don't care (laughs) um but when we're talking about a dog who's going to intervene in saving your life i don't care if you love the dog or not The dog woke up and saved your life. I love my kid. My kids aren't diabetic, but if I can guarantee if one of my kids became diabetic, I would be training the best dog I could and not just any dog. Just because I love the dog isn't a reason to train it. I mean, you should train the dog to be a a great, the greatest dog that dog can be, but to do intervention and life-saving techniques to, depending on how you want to look at that, no, I, I'm going to use, I'm going to go find the best dog I can and then use that dog. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's really about, like you said before about percentages of, um, you had that one dog that was 90%, um, and then you can be as, as low as 75%. Um, I'm sure that would be different if you were using other breeds, that percentage would maybe be, you know, much different. Yeah. And, and somebody would create a Facebook group that hates on me because, my dogs aren't performing to the level that I say they will. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't need uh, business side. You know, we don't, we don't need that. I, this is how I feed my family. (laughs) So, (laughs) so what then, um, you know, it's very particular and making the decisions and, and how and what you train. Um, So from a larger perspective of the community, what not just your kennel but throughout the country throughout the united states how common do you do you know any kind of stats and how common it is for a a type one diabetic to have a diabetic alert dog or you know what percentage of that population ends up having something like this as a resource you know what i don't i can tell you this nine mean nine million people searched diabetic alert dogs in the past three months Wow. Wow. Okay. 
Um, I can tell you that I had 65 phone calls this past, I shouldn't say phone calls, inquiries, 65 inquiries in the past five weeks. And of that, probably 30% had never heard of them. And almost none of them were, maybe two were without fundraising i had two who were prepared to move forward and purchasing one oh god uh, and they'd been researching it so based on those numbers i would say maybe one percent have diabetic alert dogs mm. you know the the big non-for-profit which is diabetic alert dogs of america I, the last i heard they put out 100 to 120 dogs a year so i mean and you know they're huge they they have a they have a big team sure. and a large network and they're only putting out that many dogs so sure. it's it, yeah well, i would say less than one percent have gotcha. so have then, trained dogs but in a, by by that so diabetic alert dogs eight is governed by or service dogs is governed by ata uh, Department of Justice does not recognize any certification for service dogs. Um, so somebody can train their own dog. But I would say of trained dogs by outside trainers, I would say less than 1%. So then what? how many people, let's say a month, well, let's say over like a three-month time period, end up taking home a dog that you've been working with? out of curiosity i can we right now in the kennel have two dogs working two dogs and and i ask that not to just hear your numbers but to to put in percent yeah. to perspective of how much work it takes for for this type of uh training I, and as well as then to have that type of service is is a lot of work i have i have one on the way so i'll have three and well no i have two more on the way I'll have four in training by the end of next week starting process. Mm -hmm. um, I can alone, the way our kennel is currently set up, I can only train. 10 would be really pushing it. I work, I come home in the evenings with my family and uh, try to spend family time. I try to go to my boys' hockey games. I, you know, my kid's very active. I go to a lot of his sporting events. Uh, he plays travel hockey. I don't get to travel with him to tournaments anymore, but you know, I'm back last night. I was up at, uh, I left the house at nine o'clock and I was at Walmart until 1am training, uh, in, in public preparing a dog to be there during the day. Um, so it's around the clock thing and it's, it's a big dedication piece, but it's worth it. It's, it's amazing. So yeah, I'm ready for it. Bring them on. So, <laughs> so with, um, with your kennel, then uh, you guys are based off in Waterloo, Illinois, which is near St. Louis, right? Yeah. So uh, Waterloo is about 45 minutes from downtown, from downtown St. Louis. So how far is your outreach or in, you know, the two or three years that you've been kind of, you know, servicing the diabetic community uh, as it goes to coast. coast to coast. Yeah. What's the, I got a dog range? in Connecticut. I'll have a dog in uh, Seattle, Washington in November. So in November we'll be coast to coast. Okay. And do you do have, any like out outside the country stuff or is it all inside? So yeah, we have, I'm act. <laughs> I'm actually trying. She has a really nice cocker. There's a God bless Instagram. There's a girl on Instagram who has a really nice cocker. And I know the guy who she bought it from. And he's like, Hey, she's type one. I'm like, really? So I messaged her. I'm like, Hey, can I train your dog? <laughs> <laughs> and she it's said really, yes. uh, we're going back and forth. <laughs> if, if she, I mean, it's still a lot of money. Um, yeah. It's, 2400 pounds no 2400 us just to ship it here right so oh it's a lot wow. of, yeah yeah so um but if i can convince her that'll put me in northern ireland uh so cool. and i probably talk to i talk to a lot of people right every day mm -hmm. and i have a hard time of of getting on the phone and helping them anyway uh, 
so those people that call with the pet dog that I'm not going to train, I'm like, well, let's teach you how to do obedience. <laughs> and then, you know, I end up helping them. But um, I talk, I've talked to probably five potential clients in Australia and three potential clients in the Ireland, UK area. So we're getting wow. there. It'll get there eventually to be international. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and super exciting too. Uh, yeah, it is. The story of how it even unfolded. So with the, I want to take a moment then just to kind of give a, a ballpark of, of even what you were saying, the, um, the standard of the industry or, you know, of other trainers, you know, on average is, is what you said, like 15 to 30,000 per, per dog. Right. Um, so, and that's just an estimate of a range. Uh, does, how do people just end up straight up pay for this? I'm sure insurances don't pay for this is payment plans. How do, um, what are, what's the first step in conversation of, okay, I want a dog. How do you pay for it? So, so we go back to that. So if, if somebody calls me today and says, Hey Zach, I want a diabetic alert dog. First, we need to assess how old they are and what their competency is in dog dogs have you owned a dog before have you spent time did you get that dog trained where are you at so that that first tells me is this a started a fully or a fully trained dog and how much time do i need to spend with the dog then we roll back into what are your hobbies and you know what's the dog need to be prepared for but so then once we start with that that number and and we're we're all comfortable with the number and I'll tell you, I, my started dogs start at 18,500 and we move up from there. And now with that, people, people kind of jump out the door at numbers, but with that comes all the supplies of the dog. Um, the only thing you have to buy is food and pay for vet maintenance, vet maintenance of the dog. Um, so crate, food bowls, leashes, harnesses, everything you need for your dog, I'm bringing it. Um, and then full support, the dog's allowed to come back to me at any time for maintenance training, as well as, and my wife loves this, my phones aren't 24 seven. If you call me at 3 a.m., I'm answering. So um, constant support that you're not going to find anywhere else. And so, yeah, we start out 18,500. That delivery cost to your house is included plus the three days. Mm -hmm. Um, most people go, holy shoot, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and I go, I'm very sorry. I wish I could make it cheaper, but we use very high end dogs in the margins. Well, in business, you have to have some kind of margin. And sometimes my margins aren't as good as I would like, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm passionate about it. And so I keep doing it, but so we talk about the number, we're happy with the number, we decide on a number. Those people either fundraise for that money, they have it out of pocket, or they've been saving. And, and or the third option is we decide on a, a fair number to put down, depending on what the ultimate cost of that dog is for me to ship across from the UK, uh, between 20 to 50%. So to wrap this up cleaner 20 to 50 percent hey you guys are frozen on my end are you are you there oh yeah, there you yeah. go. we can we, we've heard you loud and clear okay no that's fine so so to clear it up though so you decide you're going to get a diabetic alert dog you put 20 to 50 percent down and then you can make monthly payments or you can pay the remainder balance at time of delivery what that does is gets people hey i have a dog now and if you're like me, sometimes I have to have it before I'm willing to pay for it. So if you already, hey, I have to come up with this money, well, then through fundraising and extra hours at work, you're going to come up with the money to get that dog. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I tell people, I'm like, just, just pull the trigger, just do it. But, you know, that payment plan is based on time of training. Unfortunately, sure. Uh, you, you could take out a home refinance loan, uh, or you could do a home line of credit, 
mm-hmm. or you can take out a personal bank loan, but no bank will actually loan you money on the dog because unfortunately dogs can die. Uh, so the banks go, that's too much risk. I've already asked almost every bank in America and they all turn me down. Um, and then the insurances laugh at us, uh, which, is, which is really sad. There's been some cases where the insurance will pay for it. The one girl I know where insurance paid for her dog, she was in the hospital 15 times that year. Wow. And her body was rejecting the CGM. Um, she, I don't know if she was having a larger reaction to it or what, but it just didn't work for her, right? So then insurance says, we're going to pay 75% of your dog. But for the most part, it's all out of pocket some way or somehow or fundraising. So wow. it's, it's rough and I hate it. I, you know, and the non-for-profits, they, they still charge. So we are a for-profit business, but really it's not that much difference in the cost versus the quality of what you're getting from a trainer to, you know, these volunteers do the best they can, but they still have jobs. They, you know, or what our other lives. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's rough. It, it's a nasty conversation to have because I wish, I wish I could just give them all away. I really yeah. do. Yeah, I think that's um, the reason why I wanted to bring it up was uh, just to, because probably everyone who would be listening to this would be having that thought. And the number is, the investment is, is so large, but, and there's a reason why the number, as you just explained it, is what it is. But um, I, to anybody that might say it's not worth it or, or the value isn't there or anything like that. I mean, this is a, another strategy to save your life and to what, what you were saying, you have a dog that's at 91%, you know, like yeah, that's she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like she makes me proud. <laughs> um, do you still have connections? Do you still like get Snapchats or photos? Yeah, of, like, the she's, dogs on, the family? she's on Instagram. Oakley, the diabetic alert dog. Oh, okay. I see. I yeah. See. Yeah. She's on Instagram, but Alex and Alex is one of those kids that's been diabetic since she's 10 years old. She's like, please use my name. Talk about me and let me know who I can help. This is cool. So Oakley mm-hmm. comes back to me and I give Alex a new diabetic alert dog for a week mm-hmm. and say, Hey, this dog's going to a client. She's like, great. And she works. Now Alex has. Oof, Alex is just an, another client. Alex lives is from uh, Belleville, Illinois. So right up the road. Um, she was our first diabetic alert dog to go out the door as diabetic alert dog, like a hundred percent. Here we go. Gotcha. And uh, so unfortunately it just hasn't been that long ago, but Oakley is a rock star, just proving us right, proven concept. And she is, Alex is so open about it as I'm finding many diabetics can be um, open about it, but yeah, Alex is a college kid and, you know, something to hit on that you had asked in those interview questions. uh, Alex has, well, we were in training one day, she was coming to the kennel uh, to get some extra time in on obedience and she's sitting there and I'm like, Alex, are you in a low? No, I, I'm fine. I'm like, sit down, get her a juice box. And she's like, oh, I was at, I was at 35. I'm like, <laughs> dude, that's a problem. So the, so Oakley hadn't even been imprinted on scent yet. And then, um, so this was a rush thing. They, her parents came to me and said, Hey, we want to get our dog. We're sending her off to college get the dog trained just in time for her as a started dog to send her to college Alex's phone either died or she turned it off and in middle of the night Oakley woke her up and she turned her phone on and she was at a 42 oh wow Oakley saved her life yeah now Alex has a lot of lows and she's like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm like, kid, you're not fine. So when I, people are like, well, what do you mean you're sending this dog to some stranger who's diabetic? Like, how do you know they're going to have a low? Well, Alex historically has about three lows a week. 
and which actually is part of the reason why Oakley is up because it happens regularly. So the yeah. dog's in tune with it, right? Yeah, so the ones that, you know, you hear about these dogs that are only 50% or only 60%. Well, how often are you having that low? If the dog's, you know, if it's once every three weeks, one, maybe the dog's not for you or the dog's there for voice of confidence or because you do live alone and kind of put a face on this on this faceless uh, disability or to help with other things like fetch a juice box. Like, Hey, I have lows. I'm aware of it, but if I can't get to the fridge. Um, so there's things that the dog can do there, but yeah, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll get off that, but Oakley, she's, she's amazing. Um, I'm sorry. I forgot where you're going, where we were going with that. Well, you were just, uh, you were just telling a story about, you know, Alex and, and I was, more um you know i was just more trying to repeat and continue to give value and 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 why it's important to have this you know as as a service out there and you know almost try to defend because you know the diabetic community is very particular and about how what the price of insulin is and and all the things and, and the effort it takes to being diabetic you know but um i almost just wanted to take a moment and say if it saves your life, it's, it's, it's worth looking into kind of thing. Yeah. So I, yeah. Cause the, I mean, it was more where I was going with it. Yeah. Cause like, even, even if you do have a CGM, I mean, I've had plenty of instances where I had my CGM in, but, um, it wasn't either on me, like, like touching my body. And so it wasn't waking me up. And when you have a bunch of covers on the sound doesn't always get through and doesn't wake you up. I mean, I've had it to where I've been sleeping and my roommate knocks on the door because he can hear the alarm and he's trying to sleep. And so he, so he knocks on my door and um, I'm like, Oh crap, I'm, I'm low. And so, you know, you, so even a CGM isn't going to be a hundred percent as far as waking you up and, and saving you from a low. So, so having something like this, um, I think is always going to be going to have some great value to it no matter how much our technology helps us out and, and saves us. Right. And, and it's a service. It doesn't mean everyone should have this service or, you know, isn't a good candidates and man, somebody could be a diabetic and need this, but their environment to have a dog might be, might be poor, you know, like not every service is for every single person, you know? So um, it's like, you know, we gave an estimate of maybe 1% of the diabetics out there have, have a dad you know, it'd be cool if that number got up there more, but it's, uh, it is just kind of how it is. And so there's no need to be upset about that. It's just, just how it is. Yeah. And you know, there's some people that they don't need it. It's, it would be nice to have. Mm, yeah. and unfortunately, it seems like the people who don't need it and seems nice to have financially go, Oh yeah, I can afford this. And it's like, Okay, great. But the success story, the stories that drive, that keep me driven are, yeah. you know, I got a kid out of Nebraska right now, single dad, and lives alone. And he has a three year old son, and his three year old son found him unconscious. Oh, wow. Wow. And I want to go, damn it, I just want to give him a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and as a business side, I got to be like, okay, I can't do that to my family. I yeah. can't take this yeah. time away from them. But at the yeah. same time, it's like, hey, kid, whatever you need fundraising wise, let us know. We're here for you. We're going to support you. And when you get this dog, like, you're the story that I'm pumped about at the end of the night when I go to sleep. Mm, that, yeah. you know, I made a difference in your life. Um, and not, not that finance, financial situations, you know, just because somebody can't afford it doesn't mean they don't deserve or don't need it just the same. Right. Right. But yeah. there's just always something about a story that, uh, that gets a guy, um, and gives you chills. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it really, honestly, it, it pisses me off. Uh, the insurance is, the insurance companies should pay for it. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I don't know what the right answer or the why or the how to make that necessarily work. I can tell you, there's a list of insurance companies sitting on my desk that I call every single day to talk to somebody new. 
in trying to get insurances to work with Cedar Oak Kennels as a trusted partner. Um, that would probably be a big reason why they don't is because there are alternatives, CGMs, uh, to this that by numbers are better than the dogs, even though I can tell you like Oakley, for example, beats the Dexcom all the time. Um, and I will tell you that the military ran numbers aren't IED fines. So improvised explosives uh, that are hidden, the dogs were beating the equipment. Um, I think we're finally, and actually, the Reader's Digest, is that the small little magazine with the jokes yeah, on the, the back? Little, mm. Yeah, the little book, yeah, yeah, book, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was at Walmart last night working a dad, like I said, and as I was walking by, there's a picture of a golden retriever on the Reader's Digest, dog detects cancer. I think the world's starting to recognize that even though the technology we look at as an advancement, that you'll never beat the olfactory of a canine. And um, I think one day we'll get the insurance companies to pay for it, but it's very aggravating that they don't yet. But yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, good on you for actually calling the insurance company and, and not be like, oh, hopefully somebody, you know, we had um, – uh a guy who you know his his instagram handle was t1d flyer and and he was a big advocate in trying to get type 1 diabetics in the air right and like doing legislation and and those types of things and here calling insurance any diabetic knows calling insurance sucks a lot and it takes long 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 time for various reasons and uh the fact that you're spending your time calling insurance just to try to get this covered is is you know, should give testament and people rest assured about your character. Not, I mean, the first five minutes of this podcast, people should have known about your character, but, uh, um, you know, in, in a good way, not, not in. <laughs> yeah. We won't dive into too many stories about the St. Louis area and things I used to do as a kid, but yeah, I try, I try to make up for those wrongs. <laughs> right. Right. Penance. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah. As long as you don't cheer for the blues, that's okay. I'll forgive you. Uh, uh, my kids, so this is cool, and I still cannot get the guy. I'm going to get in so much trouble for saying this on a podcast. Sure. So, so my kid my kid plays hockey. His second cousin is Clayton Keller. Uh, okay. Clayton Keller plays for the Arizona Coyotes. He's a Belleville boy. Mm -hmm. um, I adopted my son, so Clayton's not related to me at all uh and he's not related to my wife but he's related to our boy and um max dami and clayton are best friends and i'm like come on put me in contact with max dami because i just <laughs> want to train his dog because the awareness that we could do and max has a dog and you see him kind of in the background and sometimes he posts about him but it's like dude you could do so much awareness for that dog like come on let's do it um so that's one of my big goals and aspirations is to train a dog for Max Dami just to get uh, awareness or like Jay Cutler. And it has nothing to do with those guys being pros and famous. I don't care. They're just normal guys, but their reach is so big that, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to reach one of those guys and train them a dog just so we can do, you know, awareness campaigns and, and push that, that, hey, these guys are, these dogs are here to, to help you. Mm. wow very very cool yeah yeah i think your work is is very like you said it's very specialized and um very um i think beneficial to a lot of people um and so you know i commend you for for putting in the effort to learn all this stuff and and get better and better at it and then also produce a good product because um i think both me and garrett recognize especially in the health field and kind of where the niche that we get into is like specializing for that person that walks in your door, getting them the best care or the best um, scenario for them. And so um, going that extra mile always makes a huge difference. And, um, and it sounds like you're right along that alley of trying to do as much as you can for that specific person to make sure that they have the best product um, that they 
that they can get. hundred percent. Yeah. And you know, I, my mom put us, my mom owns a restaurant in a little town called Redbud, Illinois, where home actually is. So the kennels in Waterloo and home to Redbud. And uh, she, you know, I grew up with her working in a restaurant and working two jobs. And she, uh, when I turned 16, she's like, you're getting a job at Dairy Queen, you're getting a job at Subway and you're learning customer service. And then we went and worked in the bar once it opened. And, you know, especially with the bar, you see it where it's her baby and how she raised us that, you know, you go above and beyond and your customers will stay loyal and that customer acquisition and keeping them loyal, it's priceless. So not only is it a good person thing to do and, and just being raised correctly by those who came, who, who raised me up, but uh, I think it's a testament of, of just, you know, that's what good people should just, good people do good for good people. And I just want to do right by people um, yeah. the best I can. And you guys, man, you guys are awesome. <laughs> I see you. I see you out there hustling. Um <laughs> You know, it it's just the right thing to do. Mm. The right thing's always the right thing. So simple as yes, that. Yes, sir. So as we kind of wrap up here, um, we're gonna do one of our favorite segments, which is burst my beta cells. Um, so what has been bursting your beta cells or grinding your gears? Mine? Yeah, yeah. you. Oh. <laughs> are we gonna do you guys want me to talk about health or do you guys want me to talk about dogs you can talk about whatever whatever especially since you're not a diabetic you can you can you got you got more beta cells than all of us so they can actually burst <laughs> so it's a unique situation here where we're figuratively oh. bursting <laughs> you want to go down a rant or should we keep it to the podcast Whatever you're feeling. Well, yeah, let's go. So, so my wife. <laughs> I love it already. This will be good. <laughs> I hope to God she can't hear me. I'm in the basement because the baby's still <laughs> late. Um, and so we have a 21 month old, a nine month old, and an 11 year old. Oh wow, busy house. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. The Irish twins. Uh, I always wanted them. I got them. Be careful nice. what you wish for yeah nice. uh, okay so she drives a very it's used but she drives a very nice car she drove a very nice car she drove a, a tahoe um ltz that we bought you know we bought it used but you know tahoes you can get them with fifty thousand miles on them and they're still in really nice shape mm -hmm. uh and then she was driving a lot for hockey before the babies were born so she bought a Jaguar E-Pace. Her first car she bought on her own. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, she traded in the Tahoe <laughs> for the Jaguar E-Pace. And about the same caliber. Oh. <laughs> the Tahoe and the Jaguar. <laughs> they, uh, price wise, they are actually. Oh, really? But, uh, oh. Yeah, but size wise, they are not. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fast forward to one baby. So we only had, so at that time when she traded in, we had one baby. So before Tahoe, we had no babies, got the Tahoe, had a baby, only having one baby, Jaguar E-Pace, had it for three months, have baby. Two car seats in Jaguar E-Pace, 11-year-old brother, can't put a seatbelt on in the middle seat in the back seat. Dad can't sit in the passenger seat because the baby seat is rear-facing and I literally can't fit in the front seat. I have to drive. <laughs> okay. So that's great. So we finally get to a financial situation where we can get rid of it. And we move some things around and, you know, small family who owns small business and she works as a surgical tech. Um, I'm sure you can see where I'm going. We're not, you know, raking it in here. And so we get her a Yukon, a used Yukon, and she loves it. And I'm like, yes, finally. All, both babies in captain chairs, 
The 11 year old can crawl through with no problem, get to the back seat. His hockey bag and a stroller fit, which if you have a hockey kit out there and you know how big a hockey bag is, plus a stench, yeah. it is nice <laughs> to be able to fit it comfortably yeah. and for him to put it in there himself, which he can with that lift gate. Mm, so you yes. hit that lift gate button and he just throws his hockey bag in and gets in. You don't have to get the babies out. So my wife, we're eating lunch together the other day in my mom's restaurant, barn grill, the office. And she says, <laughs> I said, what? Oh, nothing. She's typing away on her phone. I'm like, who are you gossiping with now? And she's like, oh, I'm not. So like, ding. I'm like, what? Facebook. How mad would my husband be if I got a minivan? <laughs> now I'm 30. I don't know how old you guys are, but you both look young. And I was a correctional officer and I wanted to be a firefighter. So I have this, even if I'm not, I have this, I'm cool vibe. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I listen to gangster music, uh, real gangster music. I listen to rock and roll. I, in, I used to enjoy myself too much as a young man. And I am pretty much deemed wild in the town that I come from. <laughs> There's no way in hell, sorry to cuss, that I'm driving a minivan. <laughs> so within 30 seconds, I post on Facebook and I said, uh, asking for a friend, I'm looking for a divorce attorney. In the town <laughs> of Redbud in Waterloo, we cannot go anywhere without people pulling us aside and either A, thinking I was serious B, thinking she was serious and sending me pictures of minivans. Oh, or wow. C, laughing at me, thinking that I'm silly for want not wanting a minivan. I'm here to tell you, as a 30-year-old dad, and I will be able to drink in a bar with both my sons and my daughter won't be allowed to leave the house. So she'll <laughs> just have to, I don't know, learn how to sew. But... <laughs> that's so awful to say moms out there women out there i am not saying women shouldn't be able to do anything and everything they want but my daughter my beautiful little angel blaine she is to be protected in my home and she can become a nun that's the way i see it <laughs> <laughs> she's my baby girl i don't want her to get hurt <laughs> I, mm. you, that should be a good thing it shouldn't mm. be a down thing um no, really, she can do it. She'll have a dirt bike just like the boys. But, uh, there you, go. you know, I plan to stay, be a cool dad. So to the minivan dads out there, props to you. But I don't think dads under the age of 40 should wear white Nikes with white socks or drive minivans. <laughs> I think I could get behind that. Yeah. What do you guys think? I think normally if you buy a minivan, it comes with the white Nikes and the white socks. Like that's like an added bonus. That's that's how you make that purchase. I just <laughs> you're so frustrated. Who <laughs> one? We drive five hours to Chicago for hockey tournaments in middle of winter. Like, I get their all-wheel drive. That's great. If you've never drove in Chicago in the middle of the winter down a side road that's been plowed in, like, <laughs> the Tahoe still has the tires that we bought on it, which, you know, we bought it used, so it, it came with them 22-inch rims and uh, street tires because I'm sure it came out of St. Louis. But it will soon get 18-inch rims again and all-terrain tires. Like, this is not, this is a tank. <laughs> yeah. And, and the windows are tinted black, so you can't see inside. Um, but, and it might be really loud when I drive by versus my wife. Uh, you get that window shake. But let me tell you something. I am not window shaking any van windows. So <laughs> my work truck doesn't do that. And I'm like, you're, you're not, no, we are not giving up this yukon for no my cool factor just 
No. <laughs> wow. Wow. What about you, Grade? Oh, I will say traveling because I um I drove down to Arizona this this week to uh, take my first load of stuff because I'm actually moving out there at the end of the month. And um, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we took the first load down there. So we drove 24 hours out there and it was rough. And luckily my blood sugar was pretty good throughout the whole thing. So no problems there. It's just, just the pure fact of, um, putting in a marathon of driving, um, not, not excited about it. Not excited about doing it one more time either. So, so that's kind of been bursting my base. What about you, Garrett? So, and, uh, in a similar fashion uh, of Zach of just kind of uh, being a little more random, I suppose. Um, you know, I've had this electricity thing going on in my house for a while where my lights flicker and, and I'm renting right now. And um, come to find out after, you know, how I don't know how many months I've lived here um, that it, it fried with one of my, you know, one of my equipment that I have. Uh, like my receiver for my, my stereo system. And um, it, it was like the, the wiring was all bad. The gr- there wasn't a neutral the ground. Wasn't really like to wet earth or anything like that. And by the time we called the electric company today, it was fixed within a day. And it just like really made me irritated that out of however many months, of like flickering lights and like the fridge going on and off and just all these other inconvenience, first world problems. That was just a single phone call by the actual landowner when they decided to care a little bit more and, uh, and um, got things rocking and rolling. But on, on a more diabetic side of things, uh, um, I'm currently in between transmitters with my CGM uh, without between the Dexcom and I'm using finger sticks and man, even though I've been diabetic for almost 14 years, I still can't get a, a good finger stick every, every time. And I'll waste like 10 finger sticks of, of checking my blood. Cause it's not enough or wrong timing, or I don't wait till it says ready. And while it's still counting down and whatever else. And so that's a minor frustration as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's always a bummer. I mean, those, are, those aren't cheap. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're expensive. So. Mm-hmm. There we are to that cost thing again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I once um I once had to argue like all of a sudden then my insurance company years ago were, were denying my test strips because I was wanting to get a lot of data and I wanted to like understand my low blood sugars a lot more and my my, my patterns. And somehow in the insurance side of things, I got flipped from a type one to a type two. And they're like, well, type two shouldn't be testing that much. So with the number of six you say you have per day and the number you put putting in order, we're, we're denying you. And one, I was texting because I was, I'm not a type two, but two, who the hell cares if I was type one or type two, if a type two wanted to check their blood sugar to understand their blood sugar more and, and to really dial in their health, why should they be denied that fact? And, you know, and then, so that that's really, like that's almost an older person, my beta cells, because it's it happened a long time ago. And I was just like, there's no reason for you, an insurance company to dictate how much I need to check to understand my blood sugar when you're just trying to cut costs and save money. Yeah. So, Zach, thanks so much for uh, being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. Um, definitely one of the more fun uh conversations that we've had and especially the the parts that we may or may not include as bloopers and so (laughs) uh, we appreciate your time here and is there anything uh, you want to say how can people find out more about uh, your kennel and and get in contact with y'all absolutely so you can reach us on our website at cedar oak kennels at gmail.com oak is not plural kennels is Um, we're an instagram uh, if you search diabetic alert dogs, we'll pop up, but the easier way to find us on Instagram is Cedar Oak, all one word, capital C, capital O, kennels, and it will come right up. And then from there, uh, you'll see our, our service dog 
page is tagged and you can you can find our diabetic alert page uh, we're on Facebook at Cedar Oak Kennels and then my cell phone and the business phone number are all one it's 618-719-6774 you can text me I might not get back to you as soon as I'd like but um, if you're serious about di buying a diabetic alert dog please uh, check out the website there's a frequent ask questions page there and you can uh, fill out a quick application it's just a few questions doesn't take longer than two or three minutes and uh, I'll get back to you usually within 12 to 24 hours depending on the time of day Perfect. awesome all right well it was great having you um, hopefully everybody enjoyed enjoyed the podcast and has some questions from it so obviously contact us and, and we'll try to answer as much as those as possible but um, we will catch you on the next episode of the diabetes podcast see ya thank you so much for listening to today's episode if you found value in today's conversation we would appreciate it if you gave a five-star review it really helps us branch out our community and get our message across to those who really need to hear it if you want to interact with us on social media, you can follow us on the Die Buddies podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or moral outrages, you can email us at thediebuddiespodcast at gmail.com. Thanks.